The postseason is upon us and every game for the rest of the season is win or go home. Some of our teams have already closed up shop for the winner, while some are still in the hunt for championship glory. All that and more coming up on Hardwood Heroes right now. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Hardwood Heroes. I'm your host, Sean Knighting. As I just mentioned, we are in the thick of tournament play, and we have several teams advancing to the later rounds. We have a packed show coming up, so without losing any more time, let's tip it off. As you know, Mother Nature wasn't on our side this week, but Danny Jean and, on, and Josh Gregory, our online hosts, that isn't going to change our show. You're absolutely right, Sean. Our reporters braved the snow to cover the start of the girls' postseason and the end of the guys' regular season. Stick with us to see where your favorite team stands in the bracket. The Waterford Lady Wildcats are expected to make a deep run in the tournament. You'll see why up next. And it's a different story for the Lady Marauders. Their season is over while the boys capped off their regular season this weekend against Vinton County. Even without one of their best players, the Eastern Lady Eagles entered the tournament as the second seed in the Hawking, and the boys ended the week with a tough loss. Moving to the Ohio, the Athens girls season came to an end after their closest game of the year, and the boys also had a big matchup but fell to Alexander. Speaking of those Spartans, the boys, like you said, ended their regular season with that win, and with a part of the TVC Ohio crown, the girls kicked it off in the tournament. The NY Lady Buckeyes, one of the other teams that share the top spot in the Ohio, took on their first postseason game, and the boys struggled after a losing week. And it was all losses in Lancer country. The boys enter the postseason with a loss to Miller, and the girls met the end of their season against South Gallia. Staying in the Hawking, two Lady Tomcats found extra time to juggle cheerleading with basketball. Stay tuned to see the full story and it's the same old story in MacArthur. Both Vinton County teams gave it their all this week. The boys will enter the tournament on a strong foot and the girls move on to the second round. You know, with each team fighting to play another day, we see a whole new side to these athletes. It makes, our, makes choosing our hero of the week pretty interesting. Well, who knows, maybe we'll see a new side of Sean's guessing pattern. You were one for three last week, so who have you got this week? I know they only played one game, but I got to go Seth Richardson from the Alexander Spartans and then Nikki Kish from Trimble. We'll stick around to see if Sean's got him right this time. All right, I'll certainly be looking forward to that too. Thanks, guys. As regular seasons come to a close, many teams look to make their final tune-ups before the postseason begins. And for the Waterford Lady Wildcats, they ended their season as strong as they started it. Waterford reporter Andrew Hartman is here now. And Andrew, how are these ladies looking? That's right. The Lady Wildcats could not have ended their season any better. Waterford dominated opponents throughout the second half of their schedule and got revenge in their last game of the season against Parkersburg South. But their success would not stop there. Waterford began their quest back to Columbus on Thursday night in the sectional championship against South Gallia. The Lady Wildcats dominated the game from start to finish, forcing the Lady Rebels to 31 total turnovers. Sensational senior Danny Dreher, you know, she filled up that stat line once again for the Lady Wildcats with 18 points, 5 assists, and 3 steals. But it wasn't just Dreher who took over. Teammate Regan Porter, she tossed in 15 points of her own and added 7 boards. You know, this team looked determined and on a mission during their first playoff game. But before we start looking too far ahead into the postseason, we need to break down the rest of the district for the Lady Wildcats. Waterford will face the winner of Western and Glenwood on Thursday night in the district semifinal. Now, assuming that the Lady Wildcats can advance to the district finals, Waterford will have to face a very tough opponent in Notre Dame. The Lady Titans of Notre Dame are sitting at the number two seed in the district with a record of 20 and three. You know, this matchup has the potential to be an extremely tough game for Dreyer and company, but Sean, after seeing these ladies play, it is really hard to bet against them. Now, I'm not going to lie, I see the Lady Wildcats running away with the district crown. We'll see if your predictions are right, Andrew. Thanks. Now, Meg's reporter Clark Woolley and Jordan Gallagher join me now on the side set. The boys were supposed to play their final two games of the season this week, but Mother Nature had other plans. Yeah, for the second time this season, Weather postponed the highly anticipated matchup between Meg's and Benton County at the top of the TVC Ohio. Luckily, Marauder fans got to see their boys square off against Nelsonville York Friday night, and boy were they in for a treat as Meg's dominated in a 65-39 victory. 
There's no sugarcoating it. It was just fantastic basketball. The Marauders outshot, out defended, out hustled the Bobcats all night. And when I say the Marauders, I don't just mean the starting five. Yeah, that's right, Jordan. Coach Fry was at it again, showcasing the talent he has at his disposal on the bench. Earlier this season, we saw Christian Maddox break into the starting five with a 23-point effort against that same Buckeye team. Friday night, that player happened to be junior guard TJ Williams, who led the Marauders with 13 points and chipped in three rebounds and two steals. Because of the lopsided score, the Marauders were able to rest Caleb Sheets, Luke Musser, and Colton Lilly in the second half, which played a big role in their quest to clinch a share of the TDC Ohio against Vinton County. Kicked off their postseason play against third-seeded Vinton County. Was Megs able to pull off that upset? Well, Sean, it was the third time these two teams played each other this season, and unfortunately for Megs, the third time wasn't the charm. Megs won an 18-2 run after going up on 6-0 from the opening tip. The Lady Marauders even went to the locker room at half with a 26-22 lead and nothing but upset on their mind. Unfortunately, the Lady Marauders proved why they were the lower-seeded team as they were haunted once again by the same problems that kept them from defeating, defeating Vinton earlier this year. The Lady Marauders' youth and diminutive stature was unable to stand up to the Vikings' senior leadership and the dominant post play of Michaela Puckett and Jalen Hale, who made it their game to take over in the latter half, defeating, leading to Megs' 54-47 defeat. Despite the loss, however, Coach Cleland talked to us about his team's youth and how he's excited for the future. We'll have 10 lettermen coming back. I mean, I've done this for 25 years. I've never had a team where I have 10 lettermen coming back. That's huge. And a good thing, you know, the exciting thing is they can all play basketball. Sean, look for the Lady Marauders to be a big factor in how the TVC Ohio shapes up next season. Guys, it certainly sounds like the future is bright out in Pomeroy. Thanks for the great work. For the very latest updates on your favorite teams, tournament scores, and updated brackets, the only place to go is at Hardwood Heroes on Twitter. Give us a follow to stay up to date on all of the TVC action up until the state championship game. And remember to use the hashtag TVCPost to keep up with news and to share your thoughts. The Eastern Lady Eagles had the season that most expected out in Reedsville, and Eastern reporter Taylor Nimmo is joining me now. Taylor, how did the Lady Eagles finish up in the final conference standings? Sean, they finished the season out second in the TVC Hawking for the second year in a row behind Waterford. Coming in second behind a state championship contender is nothing to hang your head on. They lost Madison Williams with a torn ACL, and her absence was definitely felt. Sophomore Liz Collins stepped up and took a leadership role along with Laura Pullins for the team this year. When Laura was off her game offensively, Liz was there to pick up the slack. Back on January 11th, Laura only had two points, but Liz stepped up and contributed 12 points, leading the Lady Eagles to a win over Southern. In order to do well in the tournament, Liz and the rest of the Eagles will need to take a step up. They will need a total team effort and not solely rely on Laura for their offensive production. So maybe we'll see a deep postseason run from the girls, but the boys had a really weird week due to the weather. Yeah, Sean, the game on Tuesday against Fedhawk was canceled and rescheduled to February 26. They had their senior night on Friday and things did not go as planned for the Eagles. They had a slow start. They weren't able to make any of their shots and they really struggled when Southern started double teaming them. In the second half, they came out with a whole new game plan and it showed. They switched from their zone and started double teaming Southern, which shifted the momentum of the game. Ross Keller was the reason Eastern was able to stay in the game. He was able to get rebounds on offense and put them back up for points. They could not pull out the win and fell 53-45, to but it will be interesting as Southern is the first matchup in the tournament. Coach Jeremy Hill said they have more than pride to play for this week. He told us that next week's game is where it counts. Although it would have been nice to win their senior night, next week is where it matters, and they know exactly what they need to do to make that happen next week. It's going to be a really quick turnaround for them, but we'll see if they can get that revenge right off the bat. Thanks, Taylor. In addition to Twitter, you can also follow the Hardwood crew on Snapchat under the username Hardwood Heroes. Our reporters will be at every game and one of our TVC teams is playing in for the rest of the season, giving you updates and behind the scenes look so even when you can't make the game, you won't be left in the dark. Postseason basketball brings a whole new level of intensity to the hardwood. The young Athens Lady Bulldogs got a taste of the excitement this past week, and Athens reporter Tony Heim is here to tell us about that. Tony, this was a frustrating season for the Lady Bulldogs. Yeah, Sean, Athens lost virtually everyone from last season's TVC Ohio Championship. The Lady Bulldogs only brought back two full-time varsity players, and they even lost their coach. Athens' first postseason game pitted the Lady Bulldogs against Gallia Academy in an 8-9 matchup. Gallia prevailed 43-40 in the Lady Bulldogs' closest game of the season. The shots were there for the Lady Bulldogs, but they simply could not finish, shooting just 32% from the field. 
the senior trio of Taylor Gregory, Alexis McCollum, and Sophie Miller fought like Bulldogs in their last game, combining for 26 of Athens' 40 points but it just wasn't enough to advance. So they finished their season at 5-16 and 16 with a first round exit, yet Coach McNeil had nothing but praise for this team. So what about this team is so special in his eyes? McNeil actually said that he would not trade this team for any other team that he's had. He noted how the seniors, who had so much success their first three seasons, made a point to teach the younger players the Athens way. Family was preached to this team, and family is exactly what this team was. Now, the Lady Bulldogs aren't the only team in the Plains preaching family to an inexperienced group. How is Coach Skinner handling his own coalition of underclassmen with the boys? Well, Sean, the Bulldogs were handling life without Griffin Lutz fairly well until they traveled to the alley to face Alexander Friday night. The 59-31 demolition had everything to do with the Spartans' stifling defense. Alexander forced the Bulldogs to turn the ball over 24 times. When the Bulldogs could get a shot off, they were usually met by at least one Spartan. The absence of Lutz finally caught up to the Bulldogs, who had trouble getting any ball movement going. Dalton Cozart tried his best, but the combo of Seth Richardson and Kyle Howard was simply too much for the young guard. Coach Skinner understands there will be growing pains with this group, and that's exactly what this game came down to. Yeah, when you have a young team like that, it's certainly hard to get those wins sometimes, but they did a good job, and so did you, Tony. The Alexander squads have both performed well this season and are looking to make long postseason runs in the off season, in the postseason. Excuse me. So I'm joined by Alexander reporter Maggie Shandrick. Now the Alexander boys, they only had one game this week, but it was a big one against a really big opponent. So how did the Spartans do in this game? Yeah, that's right. Friday night's game against the Bulldogs was crucial for the Spartans. A previous loss to Athens earlier this season made the Spartans want this win even more. It was senior night in the alley for the Spartans' eight seniors, and they all showed up to play. They used their athletic ability on the defensive side with their high-pressure, aggressive defense and forced the Bulldogs to 24 turnovers. Seth Richardson led all scores with 22 points, and senior Kyle Howard was all over the place. He was pickpocketing everyone's pocket, coming out with six steals, and he also added 13 points. 13 points, excuse me. He took control in the third quarter. It was the main reason why the Spartans pulled out this huge win. And coming off of that important win, what do the Spartans need to do in order to keep the train rolling into the playoffs? They just need to play their game and play with confidence. They definitely have the talent and they have great leadership from their eight seniors. They are playing against River Valley, a team they already beat two times this season. So if they show up and play like they did Friday night against Athens, then they have a really good shot of making a run in the playoffs. And to the girls' side, the Lady Spartans finished their season with a share of the TVC Heidel. They, have full, they are full of talent. The Richardson sisters led the way for the Lady Spartans. So how did that connection work with the two Richardsons on the court? Well, Sean, we hear about the Richardson sisters every week as they continue to break records and run over teams with their offensive talent. Leah, a junior, has led the Lady Spartans in scoring the past two years and became a huge threat to their opponents. This year, her sister Rachel joined the team and brought something very special. Rachel took over her sister's role of point guard, and this was a challenging task for a freshman. As a shooting guard now, Leah got the weight taken off her shoulders of bringing the ball up the court. This allowed her to set up and create more within the offense. So the sisters seem to have a unique connection on the court, but is there anyone else that they really connected with throughout the season? Yeah, a lot of players for the Lady Spartans really stepped up this year. It was a season of con contribution. Kendall Meeks, the only senior on the team, dominated down low and pulled down rebounds. Juniors Jayla Mace, Alexis Muller, and Nicole Hundel also brought important aspects to the squad. Yeah, it's certainly fun to see all of those people scoring buckets out there for the Lady Spartans. Can't wait to see how far they can make it in the playoffs. Thanks, Maggie. Still to come on our show, we have updates on how Federal Hawking and Vinton County close out their seasons. Plus, Nick Niehaus has a story on two Trimble Lady Tomcats players who are also doing their part to support the boys. And finally, we'll update you on the tournament brackets and this week's Hero of the Week. The Nelsonville York squads have had contrasting styles of basketball this year, and they are finding themselves at the opposite ends of the conference standings. I'm joined by Russ Heltman now. Russ, we're going to talk about how the Lady Buckeyes finished up their historic season. On a streak, that's how, Sean. The Lady Buckeyes finished this season as they started it, with two, with two victories. The ladies took down Bishop Reddy last Saturday, 48-40, behind a strong 18-point performance on senior day from Caitlin Hurd. Hurd has been huge for this team down the final stretch of the season, picking up some slack from sophomore Jesse Addis. The non-conference victory was another milestone for this squad, as they have seen four of their six losses come against teams outside the TBC Ohio. 
the girls wrapped up their season with another dominant non-conference victory over the Trimble Lady Tomcats, 62 to 39. Nikki Kish dropped in 28 points, but it was nowhere near enough as the Lady Buckeyes used their quick pace to overwhelm Trimble. Sean, these victories set them up perfectly as they headed into Saturday's Division III sectional title game against Crooksville. Yeah, that was certainly a great game, but how will they build on that success against Crooksville in the district semifinal? Sean, the Lady Buckeyes have been using one thing as a key to their success this season, pressure. Nelsville York has played at a breakneck pace all season. They need to keep it at a high level if they want to make it farther than last year. The team has seen balanced scoring from the likes of Jesse Addis and Tori Campbell all season. But the X factor has to be, as the playoff run goes deeper, has to be Caitlin Hurd. If she continues to dominate along the baseline and kick the ball out to open shooters, a district final berth could be on the horizon for the Lady Buckeyes. And the boys, they had to withstand some winter weather this week, so how were they able to handle that, Russ? Sean, the boys couldn't withstand the blizzard that was Megs. The Marauders defeated the Buckeyes 65-39 to Friday night. Hunter Edwards and Aaron Davis both dropped in 13 points, but the rest of the team was ice cold, going 3 of 15 from the field. The Marauders used a full court press from the tip, and it led to 28 Buckeye turnovers. The Buckeyes now look ahead to their playoff matchup with sixth seed Ironton. They try to take a positive from another rebuilding season. Yeah, we'll certainly be looking forward to how they can do against Ironton on Wednesday in the postseason. Thanks, Russ. The snow canceled a lot of games this week, but a loss to S South Gallia on Monday canceled the rest of the Federal Hawking Girls season. So Fed Hawk reporters Rachel Walbrown and Kellyanne Stitz join me on the show now. So where did the Lady Lancers go wrong? You know, Sean, it seems like every week we talk about how foul trouble and the lack of endurance are plaguing this team. And unfortunately for them, they just weren't able to over overcome those obstacles in their season-ending loss against the Lady Rebels. The Lady Lancers held a lead for a while in the third, but South Gallia was able to find a groove that Fed Hawk couldn't stop. The Lady Rebels played a tough game, but ultimately, open shots and good shooting opportunities from Fed Hawk is what got those ladies a win Monday night. You know, but it was a defensive standoff until the fourth. Both teams were forcing turnovers, but the Lady Lancers were unable to connect with the basket. They had more lost possessions than points in the first, but you know, Destiny Taylor was once again a leader on the court, and this time she had some help with Audrey Blake, Hannah Dunphy, and Skylar Hatfield, who all contributed in steals and rebounds. But not all the steals were fair. Fedok fouled 17 times. If they would have played with finesse and really relied on pure ball handling instead of body contact, they could avoid this issue. Fedok lost their spark late in the game. South Gallia's defense proved to be too much for the Lady Lancers. They got desperate and gave up too many crucial points. The ladies may have lost, but unlike the boys, they at least got to play. When are the Lancers going to get a second shot at Eastern? You know, the snow and the cold pushed back that matchup until February 26th, Sean. And in the meantime, they'll play their first tournament game against St. Joe on the, 20, on the 16th. The last time the Lancers faced the Eagles, Eastern took the game 57-45 in their first win of the season. The upset put Federal Hawking into a rut, but they'll have a chance to redeem themselves in a couple weeks. You know, just like the ladies, the boys have been struggling all all season with the same issues. When they take on St. Joe on Tuesday, mistakes must be kept to a minimum, and keeping possession of the ball will be crucial. And scoring on those possessions will keep the Lancers in the game if they control both fouling on offense and defense. But confidence is key. They cannot mentally shut down if things go south. You know, and when something goes wrong, that's when teams need to be more positive. Some coaches would say that the game is 80% mental and 20% talent. And once the Lancers think like winners, they have the ability to have the season with a couple of wins. So Rachel, how about you answer this for me? What is, who's one boy on the team that needs to step up in the postseason? Sean, I'd have to say Carter Russell. He's the Lancers biggest man and their biggest weapon when it comes to both offensive and defensive rebounds. If the Lancers want to go far in the postseason, he's going to have to get up and get that ball to keep their opponents from a second shot at the bucket and to give themselves a second chance when people don't shoot the ball the first time. All right, we'll see if he can indeed step up in the playoffs. Thanks guys. For video, video recaps of every game, head on over to our YouTube page, WEB PBS. You can also find stories from throughout the year, plus full shows and individual show segments. You can also visit WEB.org slash heroes for written recaps of each game as well. For a high school student, one sport in a season is challenging enough, but two is almost unheard of. Trimble reporter Nick Niehaus is here. There are two girls out in Trimble that they're taking on a lot of responsibility. I was able to sit down with these two girls who not only share both sports, but also share their name. Morgan Murphy and Morgan Asbell both battle on the court for the girls and cheer on the boys from the baseline. Morgan Murphy and Morgan Asbell seem to be doing a pretty good job staying busy during their senior year. 
Like we'll be at a school at, at the school all day long, and sometimes we won't get home until like 10 o'clock or maybe even later because we'll have school and then we'll have practice when the boys have a game, and then we'll go to the boys' game, cheer, and then come. Although neither had the intention to both cheerlead and play basketball in the same season, they found out the kind of influence friends have on each other. She got me to play, do cheerleading, so I was like, hey, since I, if I do cheerleading, you have to do basketball, and I knew she would really like it and she wouldn't regret it. They both made it clear that basketball is their top priority, but Morgan Asbell did admit to saying she enjoys her time a lot more cheering on the boys. She also gave insight on how what she learned through cheerleading carries over to how she plays basketball. So I use my enthusiasm on the bench to help bring up the players that are playing because sometimes Morgan will get down, Nikki will get down, and they really need someone to pick them up. These two Morgans have known each other since they could walk and have spent an unmeasurable amount of time together. And there's really one thing they attribute that to, sports. Whether it's playing volleyball, basketball, cheerleading, or even sitting together on the bus to these events, these two seem to be inseparable. Um, sometimes we have to split them up. They like to do drills together, and sometimes I don't know if they're going 100%. But yeah, you can tell that they, they really like each other. They're really good friends. I've learned a lot, life, like a lot of life lessons in sports that I never thought I would learn. These two don't plan on playing a sport in the spring, but you can still find them in the gym as they plan on coaching a youth volleyball team. Basketball players, cheerleaders and now coaches, the Morgans just seem to do it all, Sean. They're taking on a whole lot of stuff and I can't imagine doing that when I was in high school, so props to them. Thanks, Nick. Vinton County crossed the Jackson County line Friday night for a date with their rival, the Wilson Golden Rockets. So now I'm joined by Vinton County reporter Matt Stevens. Matt, did, how did the Vikings fare on the Golden Rockets senior night? Well, Sean, needless to say, Vinton County spoiled senior night for Wilson on Friday night with a 79-56 victory. The Vikings pushed the ball on offense and played the most well-rounded basketball of their season. But most importantly, after this victory, the Vikings have clinched a share of the TVC crown. There was only one negative that stood out for the Vikings Friday <coughs> night, and that was the injury of Bo McIntyre. McIntyre left the game in the second quarter after an apparent leg injury that is reportedly a sprain. The, he is currently day-to-day, -day, according to Coach Matt Combs. On the flip side, there were many positives for the Vikings. Vinton County pushed the ball full court on almost every possession, and their defense forced countless Golden Rocket turnovers. Vinton County had numerous second chance points courtesy of their ability to grab offensive rebounds and box out every time the ball hit the cylinder. The Vikings will be looking to get McIntyre healthy, but even without him, they will be A-OK -okay for tournament play. So the Vinton County Lady Vikings have had a tough start to the postseason, but the name of the game is Survive in Advance, and the Lady Vikings did just that. It wasn't pretty, Sean, but it was a 54-47 victory Thursday night, and the Lady Vikings looked good from the beginning, opening with a 6-0 run. However, it was short-lived as Megs answered with a 14-0 run of their own. Benton County struggled to stir up any offense in the first half, shooting 36% from the field. The Lady Vikings could not drive the lane against the Megs 3-2 zone, and they could not manage to get anything going from behind the arc, finishing just 10% from deep on the evening. The second half, the girls were wholeheartedly reborn. Benton County was able to attack the zone and shot 62% from the field in the second half. However, Vinton County will have a tough test in the second round in a matchup with Sheridan. The Lady Generals have a senior center in Katrina Shervant, who stands at 6-4. For the Lady Vikings to move on once more in the postseason, they will need to double-team Shervant, which they will likely do. Also, the Vikings will surely live and die by the three, Sean. Yeah, we'll see if they can take that message that you're sending them, and they, if they can get that ball in the hoop, we'll see how well they can do in the postseason. Thanks, Matt. Now before we let you go this week, let's take a look at the Southeast Ohio District Brackets. In Division II, the Athens Bulldogs will take on two-seed Warren on Tuesday night at Logan High School. And three-seed Vinton County will play Sheridan immediately following that game. Also in D2, the Megs Marauders played Logan Elm on Wednesday. That game is going to be played at Logan as well. Moving over to Division III, the Nelsonville York Buckeyes play Ironton at Jackson High School on Wednesday. And Alexander will play their conference opponent, the River Valley Raiders, on Tuesday. In D4, Eastern will play the Southern Tornadoes at Meg's High School on Wednesday. And finally, 1C Tribble has a bye in the first round and is awaiting the winner of Federal Hawking and St. Joe, who play Tuesday at Meg's. Now switching over to the girls, in Division II, the Vinton County Lady Vikings are the only TVC left 
PVC team left standing after Athens and Megs both lost this past week. Lady Vikings played Sheridan yesterday afternoon, and for a full recap of that game, head on over to our website. Two teams remained in D3, both the Alexander Lady Spartans and Nelsonville York Lady Buckeyes. Alexander took on New Lexington at Athens yesterday morning, and the Lady Buckeyes, Lady, yeah, they played the Crooksville Lady Ceramics. And finally, in Division 4, the one seed Waterford Lady Wildcats played Western on Thursday in the Jackson, in the Jackson Region 1 semifinal. Plus, Tribble and Belfleet clashed at Megs yesterday, as did Eastern and St. Joe, as I mentioned earlier. Recaps for all of these games can be found on our website, wub.org slash heroes. Now, Danny and Josh are rejoining me now to reveal their Hero of the Week picks, but I'm even more curious. Are my guesses spot on? Josh, how about we'll start with you? Sean, I'm sorry, man. You were really close. You guessed an Alexander player, but it's not Seth Richardson this time. It is... Kyle Howard for his strong defensive play. Now, Howard may not be the player with the most points at the end of the day, but he is key in setting up the stifling Spartan defense that has been giving Alexander a lot of dominance in the TVC, which is sometimes overlooked. Now, what's more impressive is that he looks up a lot of looks up at a lot of these players. He stands at only five foot eight inches, yet he's able to force bigger players into making mistakes. He likes to get all up in your face, and it was definitely evident in Alexander's win over Athens on Friday. He grabbed six steals and was a big factor in forcing Athens to commit 24 turnovers. But this guy can play some great offensive too. He scored on many of those steals and ended the night with a respectable 13 points. Now, Howard is a vocal leader on the court, and this gives the Spartan defense a lot more organization than other teams in the TVC. It's given them a lot of success in the season, and it's going to be crucial for them in the postseason. Man, a lot of heroes out in Albany this year, so great work out in Alexander. But for my Hero of the Week pick, it has been a roller coaster of a season for this girl, but she has asserted her dominance on the court, and that's why, Sean, you were right. Nikki Kish is my girl's Hero of the Week. The senior led the team to a win over the Green Lady Bobcats in the first postseason game on Wednesday, and Kish was just shy of a double-double, scoring 18 points and grabbing nine rebounds. She played almost the entire game, not being taken out until the end of the third quarter, and that was because she was the key factor in the simple formula that was getting it done for the Lady Tomcats. Get the ball to Kish, she'll drive in the post, and it was an instant layup. When she wants to, Kish turns up the aggression and leads Trimble on both sides of the ball. Her performance this season is definitely something she should be proud of. We only have one Hero of the Week pick left, can you believe it? In our time as online hosts, it's already almost coming to an end. So if you think that there's a player who deserves the title, don't forget to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag HOTW. And keep a lookout for our Hero team. We're going to re reveal the final list in two weeks. Hey, 50% success rate, I'll take that. Thanks, guys. Well, there you have it, folks. We are all out of time this week, but our tournament coverage will continue throughout this week, so keep up with us on social media and online. We're at a special time next week, 1118. You didn't hear that wrong. Make sure you set an alarm. And until then, I'm your host, Sean Nettie, reminding you to be heroic.